welcome everybody. The first part of this is going to be the history of academies and, and multi-academy trusts. Now there's a reason for that and that is that David, I think everybody knows David here, David interviewed everybody in the steering committee and we've spoken obviously to lots and lots of people. And if this statement doesn't apply to yourselves, then apologies, but we get a sense a lot of people are nervous about about mats and nervous about their intentions and nervous about the whole project and, and what it means. So this first part of the presentation is giving you the 30 year history of academization because we think it's really important to understand what it's about, where people are coming from, what the perspective is and what the context is. Because if you feel comfortable about the programme, I think it will be easier for us all to work with people within that programme. So there will be a lot that I'm about to share with you that you will probably know. But what I would ask is you think about whether everybody in your business knows this. Because if you've got a sales team that are out there working with mats or schools that are linked to mats, I think a lot of this history could be really, really important to them. So just to sort of contextualize that, hopefully there'll be lots in here you don't know. Um, but if there are bits that you do know, please think about whether people in your team know this and whether this is something you could share. So without further ado, has anyone heard of this chap? Apparently he's an American New Age writer. And we had a little competition at work to see who could come up with the best quote to summarise falling in love with Matt and this one. You will all know this, I'm sure. That's the characteristics of a Matt. It is a business entity. I don't know if you know, but a lot of the modelers come from Sweden. Uh, Sweden were quite uh, uh, early to, 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 to taking schools out of local authority control. One of the key things to understand is that they, they can do things slightly differently to other what you might call local authority uh, mainstream schools. For, for a start, they don't need to employ qualified teachers. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Uh, same as independent schools, they don't need to uh, uh, employ qualified teachers. They don't technically need to do the national curriculum. They do need to stick to the core subjects, English, maths and science, but they don't need to stick to the rest. So one of the reasons they do tend to stick to the national curriculum is what gets measured gets done. So a lot of people have been uh, criticizing uh, predominantly Gove about the sort of frustration that schools won't be more creative but actually if the inspectorate is going to measure basically the national curriculum then people are generally going to do it. Um, how many people here were at the Insight Day a couple of weeks ago? I'm sure you probably all thought Toby Young's uh, talk was pretty pretty top, top draw. Uh, for those of you that weren't there, Toby Young's a, a writer who set up a free school in West London and he described it as a, a comprehensive grammar. Uh, because he wanted to bring in the grammar school teaching methods, but with a comp comprehensive uh, intake. Uh, one of the interesting things that he mentioned, I don't know how many people picked up on it, is they don't do any ICT uh, at his school. They've taken it out of the curriculum completely. Uh, now, by pure coincidence, I was actually with a head teacher a couple of weeks ago whose, uh, whose son goes to, to Toby's school. Uh, and one of the things that Toby didn't tell us is they're actually on their third head teacher, uh, which was something he didn't tell us in his, his history. And it clearly did have quite a few challenges along the way. But... I think one of the things that, to pick out of, of understanding that they don't need to be in, in the national curriculum is that if you are selling to schools, don't assume that they will necessarily be doing all of the curriculum. So that free school is a very good example. They do no ICT whatsoever, which is, is quite, a, quite a brave thing to do. They've swapped it with Latin, incidentally. So, uh, so, so that, that's cool there. Last quote, I promise. I think it's the last quote. This, this is about growing up. Now, most people that we've spoken to over the last few months have no idea that the academy program is nearly 30 years old. I think most people assume that it's considerably younger than that, uh, but it's actually 30 years old. So what follows is a potted history of how the academy program came about and why it came about. The purpose actually of setting up academies was to reduce the gap between the North and the South in terms of student performance. It was identified um, that there was a big gap in terms of performance of students uh, and educational outcomes. And that was actually why it started. And that's important to understand because I think most people forget that that was why it started. It didn't start just because the government felt like doing something different to the previous government, although I'm sure that that was partly to do with it. Um, but it started to try to reduce inequality across the country. And it, it's, it's worth understanding and remembering that because one of the things that we've identified, one of the things we're doing in the, in the research is we're looking at the maths and we're actually working out the split between business background and education background for the board of directors because we think that could be quite interesting to understand. So if you've got a, a mat where everybody's an educationalist, they'll probably have a slightly different approach to uh, a mat where everybody's from, from the world of business. So to remember that because we're going to come back to that. 
Does anyone know, before I go on to the next slide, where the first, and this is in inverted commas, academy opened in the country? Anyone have a guess? So it opened in Solihull, believe it or not, in 1988. So that was the first school that opened under what we class as now the definition of an academy. The City Technology Colleges opened in Solihull. They were taken out of local authority control. Only 15 of them were opened. And this is where, I think anyway, because a lot of this is, is, is opinion, so please challenge it. Uh, I think this is where some of the terminology started instantly to become a little bit confused. So when the first 15 uh, city technology colleges opened, and bear in mind this was 88, so this was, um, uh, this was in the, during the, 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 Tory, uh, the Tory reign, um, huge investment was made by benefactors. So these schools are open. Does, do, does anyone, has anyone worked with or close to a city technology college? You can't really miss them. They were built from scratch. They literally, brand new sites, brand new building, paid for, and I'll show you the, the investment, paid for by, by benefactors to a very large extent. And um, they were taken out of the national curriculum, given all sorts of freedoms. And the verdict from an educational perspective, Brandon Mind was only 15 of them, but the verdict from an educational perspective has been superb. They are still some of the highest performing schools academically in the country. So one of the first questions you might want to ask is why did that project stall? And it stalled for two reasons. Um, it stalled because the benefactors had to invest an enormous amount of money and very quickly uh, the country ran out of people with pockets that deep. Another reason uh, was a political reason and that was that this was during a Tory government and a lot of the sites that were identified for uh, CTCs were in Labour councils and Labour councils refused to give planning permission for CTCs. So that was the sort of beginning, if you like, of the political argument uh, around academies. The, the, the CTCs would definitely be four or five times the size they are now had it not been for planning permission issues which were in the main a consequence of politics. So Ken Lord Baker described uh, the Labour councils at the time as having, and I'd, I'd never heard this phrase, so uh, a dog in a manger attitude to, uh, to progress. Uh, so that was how he described it uh, in a strop, I assume, at the time. So, uh, so, so that, that, that's what, what happened there. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who are interested, this is how much money those sponsors were, were putting in at that time. So the first CTC, ADT put in 2.2 million Pounds. So they were averaging about 20% of the cost of setting up those, those CTCs back, back then in 1988. And that ran about 1988 to about 1996, 95, 96. So that's how it started. And I think a lot of people don't realise that. And then it started again. So it all started again with this gentleman who came into town telling us all that we were... 35th, I think we, we've tried to, to check this, we'll come back to this later, but apparently according to Tony Barrett at the time, we were 35th in the world in terms of educational standards. So he got behind uh, the City Academies programme. Does anybody know who, who he chose as his architect? Mr Adonis. So Andrew Adonis was the, the architect who, who came in with Tony Blair to do this. Now, this is definitely where the first proper confusion comes with uh, the, the terminology, because Tony Blair uh, started what he called the City Academies programme, and he rechristened the people that were going to, if you like, oversee these schools. He called them sponsors, but at the same time removed the need for them to financially sponsor it. So that's where a lot of the confusion, I think, started to come from. So the original people that paid for the academies weren't called sponsors, but actually gave loads of cash. Then the people, when Blair came in, they were called sponsors, but didn't give any cash. So that's where we have to sort of change the definition of the word sponsor. The word sponsor now means that you're sponsoring it in terms of your vision, your ethos, and, uh, and your time, rather than actual cash. So, so that, that, that was interesting. And this was the first time when the City Academy started that we suddenly had, and again, this is, I think, very important to understand, a very clear pathway between being a failing school and being converted to an academy. So this was the first time that we actually had a mechanism that if your school was failing, the pathway was instantly there for you to become an academy. And if you want to look at it from a, a political perspective, it was the first time that we had a real stick with which to hit local authorities with. Uh, and that's certainly how it, how it was presented by a lot of people. So the people that sponsored these academies would generally come in with uh, a fairly strong ethos. They were encouraged to, to focus on STEM or music or, or, or PE, etc., to give the school uh, a focus. And they were aspirational. And there's lots of, if you want to read out there, there's lots and lots of very emotional uh, speeches in Parliament, all sorts of things about how people were getting behind this. However, if we roll on to 2004, does anyone remember Mr. Clark? 
So Mr Clark, who was the Education Secretary at the time, was dragged in front of the Select Committee because by this time they'd set up, only 17 city academies had been set up, and at this point they were running at £17,000 more expensive per pupil per year. So they'd only opened 17 and already they were £17,000 per pupil per year more expensive to run. So that's, that's where a lot of the fear about the cost of academies started. And they calculated, because at the time they had a plan for 200, they calculated that would cost the government an extra £5 billion to do, which they hadn't, uh, hadn't catered for. So that's why the City Academy programme started to sort of slow down a little bit because the government didn't have five billion pounds to, to spend and they went back to not to the drawing board exactly but they went back to try to work out how to do this without actually costing the taxpayer quite so much money. So the next thing that happens and we'll see people's political shades I suspect at this point was the government started as they call it and Mr Gove came in in a very very aggressive way and two really important things to understand here up to 2010, and then we're 22 years into the academy programme now, this is the first time that a school can become an academy without being a failing school. So that's the first time that's happened. So that was only six years ago. Up to that point, you had to be a failing school to be converted into, or to be taken into academy status. And Gove did introduce the polar opposite. You now had to be an outstanding school to become an academy or to continue to be a failing school to become an academy and anyone in the middle couldn't, 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 couldn't join in basically. So that's how that, that was launched in, in 2010. Um, and Gove, I don't know if you remember, claimed that there were 70% of secondary schools that told him they wanted to become academies and I don't think anybody's ever managed to, uh, to prove that, 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 that figure. So, so that's how that, that started. And I think this is a point to probably reflect on something and this is really worth keeping. As I said, quite a few of you were at the inset, inset day a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a panel of, of head teachers, and two of the head teachers, I don't know if anybody noticed, but two of the head teachers, or senior teachers, made a subtle grumble about not wanting failing schools to join their mat. Now, not only is that slightly troubling, I think, but actually it flies completely in the face of what the Academy Programme was set up to do. The Academy Programme was set up to help failing schools. That, that's what it was all about. So we've now got a, a number of people in the sector that have slightly misunderstood or forgotten that ambition and are <laughs> almost trying to set up little groups of elitist mats who they only want schools who are a bit like them. Now, that is not what the programme has ever been about, uh, and that's probably worth understanding because, as we come on to, to, to some bits later, I, we think that the regional commissioners, which we'll touch on in a minute, are going to stamp that original vision back into the sector. But that, that, this was the, the first point that started to happen. Now, this is when the, the definition of a mat, and I'm telling you this now purely because you probably need to forget all about it, we had converter academies and sponsored academies. Does everybody remember that definition? It's probably worth forgetting it now, actually, in terms of going forwards, because converters were people that applied because they were very good and wanted to become an academy, and sponsored were people that were, were dragged into becoming an academy because they weren't doing very well. That definition no longer makes any sense because mats, as they've been set up, now have a mixture of schools that chose to convert and schools that were forced to convert. So that, that distinction is probably not very helpful any longer. So if that is sort of in your language now or your, or your discussions or in your thinking, it's probably worth dismissing. And what you should probably replace that with now is, is the Ofsted grade. So when you're looking at a mat, it's worth now understanding who's exceptional, who, who's outstanding, who, who requires improvement and forget the converter sponsor label that still sort of hangs around. Is it unstoppable? Well, it probably is. That's the last few years of, of growth of academy, so I don't think that's, that's ever going to be turned around. This slide here just gives you a quick breakdown. It is using the converter sponsor once it's taken from government figures, but it gives you a sort of sense of how that landscape's looking. This fascinates me. It may not fascinate anybody else, but... Uh, Remember my early comment about the north-south divide and that the academies were set up to try to reduce the uh, performance gap? Well, actually, if you look at the statistics, proportionally far more academies opened in the south of England than the north of England. The Midlands, oddly enough, is the area where more academies have opened. I'm sure that's not, well, it may be vaguely connected to the fact that's where the first CTCs were, but um, the south, sort of in terms of the areas, second, <laughs> and, and the north of England, considerably less so. Now, 
there are lots and lots of anecdotal arguments for that. So in Yorkshire, for example, they've got some very credibly strong networks of, of schools in Yorkshire that have resisted any attempt to make them academies. And I think I'm right in saying, and you guys are almost certainly no better than me, that they're talking about converting into mats themselves, I think, just to be able to carry on with the great work they're doing without being dragged into this, this sort of um, uh, this program. But, but the statistics certainly um, didn't follow what the original vision was. And, and sadly, and you probably all saw this, uh, it was published a couple of weeks ago, that, that attainment gap still, still exists. That, that attainment gap is still, is still there. So it hasn't actually achieved what it set out to achieve in any way, shape or form. The only good piece of news that we could find, and we did try really hard to find some good news, uh, the only good piece of news we could find is that we're actually 21st in the world, not 35th. Don't quote us on this, it's really, really, really hard to get global figures. Pearson have tried to introduce something called the PISA, uh, but you, if, you can search for whatever you like. We found a BBC article saying that we're sixth in the world, and then we found loads of uh, Guardian articles saying that we're 65th, so who knows, but that, that, that's the closest we can get. So we, we've improved a bit. Can you see why we think it would be beneficial for everybody in your businesses to understand that? Because it, it sort of helps you, even though you don't necessarily think that I can use that piece of information in my next piece of marketing, it just makes you feel a bit more comfortable with what went on and why. Uh, and that was, I think we can thank Patrick for that, because Patrick was very keen that we do this element of, of the work, and Patrick was absolutely bang on there. Doing this helped us really understand what it was we were dealing with uh, and uh, what it was that we needed to research. Uh, are there any questions, or, or has anybody got any, anything in addition to add to the Academy story? Yes, yeah. You have mentioned that academization is not stoppable, basically, look at how many schools are happening, so we expect that happening more and more. But when we saw on the news, a loss in UT or head teachers actually against the idea? I think that, I, I, I suspect the issue will be that local authorities will start to lose. When we come to the way that the, that, um, the schools are funded, I think that will be the point to explain why it's probably reached a tipping point. And that is that local authorities have always taken a, a top slice uh, of school funding to run their education departments. As, as the number of schools in their region reduces that are run by them, the amount of cash they're going to get will start to reduce and the economies of scale will start to disappear. And it will reach a point, I suspect, that, that schools simply won't be able to function without turning to a mat to get some kind of central support. So I suspect that that will be why that, that's happening. But you're absolutely right. But again, I mean, one of the things that we've found uh, that we've had to be very disciplined about is whatever opinion you want to find about academies is out there if you want to find it. So you can find plenty of teachers who hated it to start with and have now embraced it, plenty that were open-minded and now hate it. It's, but I, I fear it's the, well, I think it's the economic argument that will mean that it will be inevitable. And I think there's an element of social proof in this too as they uh, speak to colleague schools who are benefiting from uh, either being in a mat or just simply become a standalone academy, then that is the thing that's going to persuade other schools more than anything they see in the press or anything that they, the pressure that they get from elsewhere. Um, and there is plenty of evidence to show that the schools are enjoying being an academy and being within a mat, a good supportive mat. And like Jason says, there is so much bad press and that's what the press like to do, like to focus on all those incidents. We don't hear all the good stories, and there are a lot of good stories out there, which I'm sure your guys, when they're going into schools, will hear that. So I think that's an important um, Just interestingly, I've heard in a couple of instances some uh, local authorities actually thriving, and I think it's just worth keeping um, in touch with those local authorities who, in spite of all this, mm seem to be winning the hearts and minds of schools and becoming more empowered. Well, Yorkshire is definitely the perfect example, isn't it? I mean, that's the, that's the exemplar that everybody talks about. And it's whether they convert to become maths themselves. I mean, N, N Trust Ed, you know N Trust Ed in Staffordshire? I mean, that, that's actually become a, a combination of the local authority and, and capita. Uh, it's, not, I don't, it's not technically a mat, I guess, but it must have, it must have ambitions to, to start to run the schools on that no, model, I suspect. Just from Hampshire a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking incredibly positively about the service that they received from their local authority. Now, that's mm. just a sample. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. I think, um, I think there's a real, it depends where you are, sit geographically, because some of the things we're seeing in some, in some of the areas that we're supplying, um, you know, we see local authorities that are struggling, they're cutting back on resources that they're offering. 
the traditional advisory services, the, the, so they do seem to... Is it, a second, is it possibly a secondary primary bias as well in those opinions, not, do you think? Or? Probably, no, not from, these are sort of central, central resources that have been available to, that historically have been available to all schools. Mm -hmm. So there are, some, there are some terms, I think, in the local authority that I'm, that I'm particularly referring to. It was an authority where particularly the secondary schools, yes, adopted, were early adopters and became, you know, became academies early on. So I think it, the, there is a real sort of because if you look geographic look, myth. If we look at these figures here, that's at nearly 50% of the secondary schools and less than 20% of the primary. And I suspect yeah. that does make a big difference. Does anybody else have any experiences in the sector to add to, the, add to that? I think going back to Andrew's point, the, uh, certainly for some authorities, Potential, their potential demise has goaded them into actually being more proactive with their schools and made them think, you know, we won't exist unless we actually do something to make our school want, want to stay with us. So. so, what's a multi-academy trust? So we've kind of got to the question now. Well, you won't be too surprised to hear it is a little bit confusing. So, I mean, this really, this drives me nuts, actually. As somebody who quite likes numbers, this does literally drive me insane. So we've got multi-academy of trusts with one school in. So we've got a, a plural used to describe somebody who's got one school, and yet an academy chain has to have at least three. So I don't quite understand how, how this works. And as actually a quote, I don't know if you can read it at the bottom, but that's an excerpt from the Education Select Committee where somebody said, this is, is not comprehensive. So somebody's come up, come into the government with a list of mats and they said, not only was it not comprehensive, it had some names wrong, some missing, some people that were mats and some that weren't. So this is, this is the DFE, couldn't even publish a list of, of mats for an Education and Select Committee. So it is a little bit confusing. So uh, I don't quite know what I'm advising here at all, but probably just forget about the word academy chain. It's probably relevant. It means three or more, but multi-academy trust means one or more. It's bizarre. So uh, an academy train, though, is just any group of schools. Now, that, we'll come on to that, that distinction in a minute. One distinction worth understanding, though, and I think this is particularly worth understanding for people that, uh, that generate resources, is the difference between umbrella trusts and multi-academy trusts. Does, any, does anyone know that, that, that difference? Is it worth going through that? So an umbrella trust doesn't technically, it's a legal entity uh, and it may contribute to the governors, but it doesn't actually own, it's not responsible for the performance of the school. So if you think of dioceses, so you'll have a religious, they're often charities or they're often with a religious basis. So they are providing the ethos for the school. They will provide a lot of people potentially to go into the governors of the board, but they're not technically legally responsible for the performance of the school. But they are there to provide, if you like, guidance in terms of the ethos and direction of travel of that school. Whereas the multi-academy trusts are genuine businesses. I think it's probably easy to think of it as the, the umbrella trusts are charitable, they're very, very charitable aims that will always have a strong ethos, they'll have some ethos that's, that's running that school. The multi-academy trusts are probably more on the business end of that, of that spectrum. Does that make sense? Now the reason I mention that is the umbrella trusts are very strong about ethos, so uh, it, it's worth understanding that their needs will possibly be subtly different to the multi-academy trust needs. But don't all, all MACs have a, they all have an ethos as well? They absolutely do, they absolutely do, yeah, they absolutely do. You, I think you're from most of the Umbrella Trusts existed long before this programme started. So they would have been dioceses in, in various parts of the country with a religious ethos uh, or charitable. So Roundtree Foundations, that type of stuff. So that, a lot of them predated the multi-academy trusts, whereas a lot of the multi-academy trusts start, started after this opportunity. Began. Would it be fair to say the Umbrella Trusts are not where the government wants to go? I don't know the answer to that, actually. I don't, I don't know. Well, we, we can add that to the... Uh, I had no idea. It's a good question. I, I understood that regional commissioners were pushing umbrella trusts into multi well, well, we're actually, we haven't got a bit of success, aren't we, getting agreement to, to talk to the regional commissioners, so um, that, we'll add that to the question, so definitely. Don't know the answer to that, so that can be an update coming out soon. So that's that difference there. And then we've created your lovely diagram. So the regional schools commissioners, they didn't exist to start with, so We've got Sir David Carter, so he's, he's the head of the National Schools Commissioner, and then he's got eight regional schools commissioners. The geography is a bit bizarre, actually, uh, of, of the regions, but, um, and they, they basically, they're the, the arbiters of a school applying to become an academy and 
which mat they can join. So, so these people here could technically veto a school joining a mat. So they're quite powerful people. Now they've not been in place for all that long. They've been introduced to try to get some, some rigor back into, into the system. So they're quite powerful. We'll talk about those guys in a, bit, in, in a minute. There's then this word sponsor again. They are called sponsors, but they're not financially necessarily putting cash in. Some of them do, but there's absolutely no, no reason for them to do that. They are ultimately responsible and they have to appoint a board of directors. Part of this research, we're actually researching the names of all of these people and determining whether they have an education background or a business background. Um, because we're hoping we might be able to get something quite interesting. Uh, you then got the local governing bodies. So this comes back to what we're probably all very comfortable with historically. Uh, so they'll appoint the local governing bodies and the SLT, which is heads, etc., etc., uh, and run the individual member academies there. So that's the basic model. Um, I mean, one thing that surprised me actually was why there wasn't a push, and I don't know if anybody knows this, because I certainly don't, why there hasn't been a push to sort of maybe bypass that. That, that. that is happening now, is it? Certainly local to me, the Aquinas Trust, which has about uh, eight schools, they've just disbanded their local government mm. bodies. When you see it like this, it looks... What's that there I mean, they, they are still taking groups of um, parents and, um, and, and governors into, into um, specialist groups and looking at particular areas across the mat, but there's no local governing body as we know it traditionally. I mean, I'm not surprised at all to see that. I mean, it was only when we saw it like this we thought that kind of looks like a... Because you no longer have to have a teacher on those, any, a parent rather, on those any longer, do you? Which was uh, presented as a, in the press in a different way. So that, that's the way that works. Another thing that's worth taking note of is where they get their, their money from. So they get their money directly from the government, but there are ten other major potential sources of funding uh, that we've li listed, listed there. Funding mats. This is an area where a lot of people thought that the money was given to the trust and then the trust gave the money to the schools. And importantly, that isn't the case. The money goes to the school first, or the academy first, and then they give money back to the trust. And again, one thing that surprises a lot of people is to, to realise that actually the academy trust, and, we, and we've put Freedom of Information Acts in to, 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 the, to the mats to get these numbers, um, on average are taking top slicing considerably less than the local authorities top sliced uh, by a, an enormous amount. So it's between three and five percent. Uh, does anyone know what top slicing is? It's literally taking that top slice of the of the school's funding and, and putting it up into the trust. So that's between three and five percent compared to between eight and twelve percent in the local authorities. Now the CFBT Schools Trust have got a very interesting model. They charge within their school, and this is worth listening to because this sounds partly counterintuitive, possibly, but then it then makes sense. If you're an outstanding school in the, the CFBT trust, you only, you're, you're only charged 3% top slicing. If you're a requires improving school, you're charged 4%. And if you're an inadequate school, you're charged 5%. So the worse your performance is, the more you get charged. Now that is because one of the things that mats are allowed to do by law is they're allowed to force a school to give them cash for school improvement. And that's worth, that is really worth understanding because if your products are school improvement products, that money will almost certainly be centralised at mat level because they are legally entitled to force a school that is failing to give them money to spend on school improvement. Uh, and that's certainly worth understanding. So if you've got school improvement products, you, it really is worth bearing in mind that that money is going back to the mats. So, so core central costs cover things like board member salaries, school improvement schemes and, uh, and financial guidance etc. So given the fact that the mats are only charging between 3 and 5 percent, um, local <laughs> authorities charged 8 to 12 percent, two questions really coming on, why have schools got less money than ever as it seems? Well a lot of that is to do with pensions and national insurance suddenly being charged to the schools so it's quite a complicated uh, equation there. But the second question is, well, if, if the mats are able to perform their job seemingly so efficiently, what, what, what's all the fuss about? So the, the fuss is, predictably, about outliers, people who have done slightly immoral or, 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 or slightly odd things. So, for example, in, in Sweden, mats are allowed to make a profit. In the UK, they're not allowed to make a profit. 
Uh, so Nick, Nicky Morgan um, said to the Financial Times, there is, there is no place for profit in education. However, it doesn't take two minutes on Google to find plenty of ways that people have worked out how to give themselves profit. So there are some pretty horrific examples of some of the academies paying businesses that the, board, the trustees own to do various services. And of course, they're making money. Brown Jacobson have been cited in all sorts of reports uh, because they're a law firm that are, are making an awful lot of money converting uh, academies. Uh, and there's lots of room and innuendo uh, around, around what, what's going on there. So clearly people are finding ways to get money out of the mats to line their pockets. But I think interestingly, there is absolutely, it appears to us anyway, looking at the select committee uh, transcripts and videos, there's no appetite from anybody to let that carry on. People are being named and shamed and uh, that's probably a very good thing, I suspect we'd all, we'd, all, we'd all agree. If you're interested in what's happening in Sweden, it's IES are the company in Sweden uh, that run and manage lots of schools and I believe that they run three or four schools in, in London as well. But, but certainly in Sweden they are actually allowed to, to make a profit and uh, nobody seems to mind. Examples you may have seen, so recently Ofsted criticised um, AET uh, for paying half a million pounds into a business that a couple of the trustees owned. So that, that was a fairly high profile one. You could, you've got the Harris Academy, £370,000 salary. So you, know, you can imagine that, that teachers are finding this quite difficult to, to stomach. There's no surprise that's where the fuss is coming from. So who, who are setting up these mats? Well, you've got philanthropists, Lord Harris of carpet right fame. He is big, very big in all that. Faith, uh, they're usually the UTs. And then latterly, successful schools. So just am very ambitious teachers who want to take their good school and they want to, to extend those, uh, that, that good practice elsewhere. They're the kinds of people that are setting up Matt. Uh, Matt. It is absolutely clear to us, overwhelmingly, it is because people want to do the right thing. There are clearly examples, but bear in mind there are nearly a thousand mats out there now. Uh, and if you are searching for bad news, it is generally the same bad news over and over and over again. Um, I think overwhelmingly they are genuinely there so to improve performance. So time for a bit more abuse. Mats are coming into for abuse from a number of places. The regional commissioners came in, clearly they were set up to, to put some order into the process, so clearly they had to slag it off for a bit in order to make sure everybody realised what a tough job they, they had. Uh, and then you've got the, the inspector. And the inspectorate, I, I think, anyway, this is just a personal opinion, seem to be quite slow to come to terms with, with mats. Uh, it, they seem to be quite late to, to doing anything about it. The inspectorate is not allowed at the moment to go and inspect a mat. There's no legal framework where, the, where Ofsted can go and inspect a mat. They can't walk into the mat head office and demand to see their files or anything like that. There is no legal framework for that. Uh, so what Ofsted is doing instead is it's doing, I think, what they're calling, what they call now, uh, Focused, focused inspections where they will literally dive in on every member of a mat at the same time, pretty much. So if your mat's got seven schools, all seven schools will be offsteaded at the same time. Um, so that's the approach they're taking at the moment. We haven't seen any comments or gossip about whether that will be changed to allow Ofsted to inspect the mats themselves. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything, but I suspect it would require uh, a change of legislation on the basis that they're a different legal entity to a school. Um, so at the moment they're not, a, they, 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 they literally can't. Now that's not to say that Matt's won't invite them in, but that, that's the, the situation at the moment. One of the biggest criticisms, and this is interesting I think, and whether it's useful or not I don't know, but one of the biggest criticisms is geography. So we think there are two sides to this argument that, that, that we've read. One is the argument that says maths are about enabling schools to collaborate so that if you've got a maths department that's struggling in your mat and you've got a maths department that's exceptional, why not get them to work together? Uh, that, that, that seems all, all, all very good. And geography clearly makes that a little more difficult. But on the other side, one of the, one of the arguments for maths being spread across the country is if we are committed to making regional differences go away, then actually a mat should have to take responsibility for schools, both sides of that, that divide. So the, there's, 
there's an interesting sort of argument both sides there, but it does seem, most people do seem to be coming down on the side of making maths geographically focused. So I don't know if anyone's got any opinions on that or any experience, but that seems to be the, the, the weight of the arguments going in that direction. And bearing in mind, going back to the regional school commissioners, on the basis that they're making decisions about maths, the fact that they're regional kind of lends a bit of weight to that, you would think. But is it, what is the opinion in the room? What, 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 what do people think in terms of whether maths should have a wide geographical spread? Uh, when do you just see big national maths develop regional hubs? They've talked about that, and the phrase is exactly that. I think they've called them regional hubs of excellence, haven't they? Yes, yeah. So I don't think that would stop a national maths occurring. It would just have to have a yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what um, uh, I think. It, I think David Carter seemed more against it than than Wilshire. Though Wilshire's leaving anyway. But yeah, absolutely. Well, what, what's people's opinions? Anyone got any opinions on whether it regional or? I think it's for years in education. It, it works around uh, pyramid groups or cluster groups, as it was known in education. And I think you've got that success of that local aspect, which is one of the challenges on the models. There's different models out there. So yes, I think yeah. it's where, where you're going to see the success and model A, which is around the UK, and model B, which is within an authority. Uh, sorry, model B, where it's within an authority. And I think it's just that um, it's that challenge of understanding which one works better. I think it's going to be on results yes, or drive yeah. the actual future model. Because it does seem odd, doesn't it? I mean, we've got people here from all over the country. This is not a big country, is it, really? You know, if you compare it to somewhere like the state. It's such a tiny country, this idea that we're arguing about uh, geographic regional, but it does seem that geography is, is something that gets most people a little bit heated about, about where it should go with the, with the mats. Could show of hands? Who's in favour of them having complete freedom to be all over the country? Who's in favour of them being localised? A lot of people don't care. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's, um, so collaboration is clearly a core part of what the DfE it wants mats to be so so that's that's why geography has become uh, something that's uh, that's been kicked around size as well is something now one of the interesting things that uh, i picked up <coughs> reading a couple of articles was that a few people are talking about size should actually be quoted in pupil numbers rather than actual numbers of schools which strikes me as sensible uh, particularly if primary schools are going to start to to become academies, then you can very quickly reach whatever people think is the ideal limit fairly, you know, with, with, with a lot of very small schools. Um, so who, who knows? Uh, but I mean, the interviews that, the, that Dave's carried out, most of the interviews with the CEOs at, at the, at the mats, uh, we've just got completely stark uh, opinions. Some people absolutely believe, yes, we want to stay regional. Others think it's an absolutely crazy idea staying regional. So. Who knows? We, we, um, we, we have a good relationship with AET and uh, they've uh, grown since those things were produced. Yes, there yeah. are 70 academies now. And the consideration with the, the uh, management there is that they're going to be asked, uh, government's going to introduce the reduction in size of right. somewhere between 25 to 30 academies, probably seeing the model, because there's this fear of many authorities being recreated. Yes, yeah. So there's this, uh, there's this challenge around how, how uncontrollable or how powerful may become if, if the group is too large. There's a, there's, a, there's a thought at the end of this presentation about exactly that, so yeah, I will. And I think the conversations I've had, um, the enthusiasm for size and increasing size tends to come from CEOs where their background is more business than those who are educationally um, oriented. And, well, pretty much that was the development. <laughs> so. I think what makes people really interesting, they're all very different. Yes, yeah, so, absolutely. You know, yeah. To, to market or to deal with, with a variety is going to be interesting. Ab ab absolutely that. I mean, I think I, I got the sense, listen, uh, watching a couple of the select committees, that the, the regional commissioners are just aching for a fight in the sense that they want to take the first school out of a mat and put it somewhere else just to prove they can. So we'll, we'll have to see where, when, when, when that happens. And so I just, and the other thing I think, because this came from the Insight Day last week, was uh, that, that one head who said that you actually need a certain number to be viable, and I think he said about 10, and that was backed up very much by the one, I, one of the one small ones I talked to who said you've got to have eight or nine just to be stable and viable, and actually for, for that collaboration to be effective. Um, and then the 20 number seems to be creeping in from last week and from the people that I saw, that's the sort of number they see themselves stabilising at. Yeah, I was, I was talking to a governor of a school in Somerset where I live the other day and they were talk, they're not part of an MET at the moment, they're being encouraged to join because that's the way that uh, it was 
that's the way it's going generally where, where I live, but they've been told in some consultation that they're, they're not a viable business unit, that was the language, and they needed, ultimately you need 7,000 people to be viable, but to be a viable entity, and they're very much using that terminology as well. Which is just, it scares people, yes. doesn't it, in education? It definitely scares people in that sector. There's no, there's no doubts about it. No doubts about it at all. This is a, a key challenge uh, for anybody that's um, any business supplying the educational sector. Is that it's um, what's it going to look like in two years' time, three years' time, five years' time? Uh, from a strategy point of view, yep. it's an absolute nightmare to understand where it's going. Because I don't even think uh, the people that are enforcing these changes quite know what it's going to look like in 12 months' time. I think the modelling, the success, the reporting is going to change the direction that it goes in. But I don't think anybody quite knows that at the moment. Oh, I think that's uh, absolutely right. One of the things that, that I, th I think that they're going to try to bring back into the the, the conversation is the fact that the MATS and the Academy programme was about helping failing schools. So they clearly said in the last uh, select committee that you will not be allowed to take on more schools into MAT unless you can prove that you have improved the majority of schools you've taken on. And that created quite a heated debate because they said, well, that's going to put the brakes on. You know, that, that will, that, because it could, if you take five schools on, it could take you two years to be able to prove that you've improved them. So that means you can't grow for two years. And then the argument started, well, what if there's a school that's absolutely failing and needs some help, but they're not near a MAT? that's past that so it clearly is as you say it's going to become quite a heated debate which is why these regional commissioners who have now got deputy regional commissioners I think watching what they're doing is probably going to be the best we can do in terms of understanding where that where that might go yeah, so one of the CEOs I spoke to said so they are pausing now they're going to get to 15 and they're going to stop um, because they need to bring their schools in um, and make them feel welcome and know that they're actually giving them that value that they're supposed to be giving them before they'll move on uh, and take some more. And I think that the maths that are going to succeed are the ones that can be that sort of self-evaluating and realise, yeah, let's make it work and then we move on, not just keep taking new ones in. So this is that, I think we've, we've touched on most of this, this is how they're planning to control the growth. Um, not necessarily the numbers, but certainly the way that the growth occurs is taking action where academies are failing, there's still that route from failure through to becoming an academy, intervening where governance isn't strong enough, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So these people I think will be the people that we really do need to do need to watch. So um, I think we all know that David Cameron made a at least one election pledge that he went on to, uh, to, to, dis to, to, to regret. There was another election pledge that David Cameron made and that was that he would publish the results of Matt's aggregated and that came out uh, a week ago. Slightly overshadowed, I think, <laughs> by, his other, by his other election pledge. So this came out and it, it, it was generally, I think, disappointing. I think most people were a bit surprised and a bit taken aback. The, the actual raw data is available as well. We've, we've got all of that if anybody wants to have a look at it and we've got some of it to look at today. Um, but yeah, it was pretty clear that a lot of these mats have not got the green light to, to add extra schools to them. So, uh, and it's clearly, I think, going back. And I, personally, I think this is... A, and this is genuinely just a personal opinion, I think that it's good that it's now been measured on the basis of what it was originally designed to do, which was to improve schools. Uh, and it's a shame that that had to be an election pledge to get that data out, but, uh, but that's, that's where that is now. So then there's U-turns and orders. There's no point in talking about the U-turn. Everyone knows the U-turn. But there was a subtle change. The Secretary of State may make a school convert. Uh, now they must. So that was a small change in the wording, may to must, which uh, clearly will make a big 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 difference. What makes a successful Matt David Carter's audit? It's a list of measures that, that, that David, David Carter is saying all Matt's should be judging themselves on and, and, and I think one of the interesting things is it, it doesn't talk about the finances at all and, and that's, that, I think that's a useful thing to understand that even somebody as absolutely as influential as David Carter hasn't put uh, financial management in, in his framework for a, for a good mat is all about educational outcomes every single part of it and that I think is an incredibly important thing for us all to understand because not, not just because of mats not just because of academies but because of TripAdvisor and all sorts of other cultural changes schools need social proof they need more than ever to know that your products can do what your products say they can do um, uh, uh, and, and that's clearly I think embedded in a lot of a lot of this here as well we have started the research and we're very proud to be given the opportunity to do it. Um, we've really enjoyed it. It's been great working with everybody 
on the steering committee, and that's going to continue. And anybody here, obviously, you don't have to be on the steering committee to, uh, to get involved and, uh, and, and contact. So I want to give you a quick um, uh, intro to the framework of, of how we're carrying out the research, and just some initial findings. Please don't get too carried away excited about the initial findings. There is still a lot of work to do. Uh, we won't be able to speak to every map, but that is an absolutely our ambition, is to speak to every map. We've got freedom of information and requests ready to start going out to them all. So th this is a really comprehensive piece of data collection. What we have to bear in mind, this is a small pitch to, to Patrick here, <laughs> is this research needs to continue. So uh, we, we, we'll publish this in November, but we're going to have to carry on collecting this data, reviewing it and watching it. This is broadly speaking what we're, what we're looking for in terms of to get our framework. So we've broken the areas of purchase down into assessment, learning, utilities, teaching, etc, etc. And we're looking at the current situation and we're looking at the direction of travel. So devolved means the schools are making their own mind up. Advisory is, well the schools make their own mind up but we've got a approved supply list if they want to use it. And then centralised, you know, the, the, the MAT is actually is buying that. So that's the framework for the, for the questions that we're, we're putting. And then we're looking at the direction of travel. Now the direction of travel has two flavours. One flavour is asking the schools themselves, so where do they think it's going, and then the other flavour is asking the mats themselves which direction they're going in. So that's very broadly in an infographic what we're, what we're looking to do. So these are the highlights. So we're using quantitative and qualitative, so we're doing a lot of interviewing and some, some surveys. Every single person we've spoken to, centralisation is, is on their agenda. There's no, there's no denying that. We, 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 can't, we can't escape from that. But a word that keeps coming up is consensus, and that, that's encouraging to hear. They want consensus from their schools. If you take out utilities and move to where schools have put in, on mats, I beg your pardon, have put in a centralised assessment solution, for example, they've been quick to point out that it was with consensus from all of their schools. Now, I don't know whether anyone can con contradict that, um, when anyone's selling assessments and has seen the school being strong-armed into using a central solution, but, uh, but that's certainly the phrase we're coming back. ITS schemes, which is invest to save. Has anyone heard these? We've heard this phrase a few times. Uh, I don't know whether who came up with this phrase first of all, but a few mats are talking about running ITS <laughs> programmes, which stands for invest to save. Uh, the few that we've spoken to seem to be running them for a period of time. So one of the things that, I sent a couple of the interviews, I know one that I was involved in, is the CEO was very pragmatic and said, if we're not too careful, we can spend more money trying to save money than we'll actually save. So I think what they are trying to do, a lot of them, are put in frameworks and methods of working which might involve a bit of an investment up front, but then they'll withdraw that investment and reap the benefits. So that seems to be the approach that they're taking. So if you hear the phrase ITS, it probably means investment to save. They look to be about one year, two year programs. This is language that's predominantly coming from the mats. It comes no surprise to you, HR, payroll, building services. No school seems to be even wanting to keep hold of that. There's no appetite to keep hold of that. So that's definitely on its way. Curriculum purchases though, there's a big hills in uh, attitude coming from the schools. They want control over that. And given the fact that we should have a makeup of schools in a mat from outstanding to, to struggling, there should be a mix of curriculum anyway. And that does seem to be, that pragmatism does seem to exist. Uh, but they are introducing approved suppliers lists. Uh, one that is coming out is that a lot of them seem very interested in creating not necessarily homegrown CPD solutions, but certainly CPD solutions that they can deliver through a peer-to-peer -peer network. That, that seems to be very popular. Uh, and I think that that definitely offers opportunities to everybody in the room because they won't necessarily have the professionalism to deliver or to scope or to create the framework for those things, even if they've got the expertise in the room. So, so that's something that's, that's come up. Does the MAT operate centralised contracts for these, for these things? This is early days, so please, please, please don't run off and quote these figures. That They'll get better and better over time and we'll keep sending out, I assume Patrick will be okay for us to, to share this as we progress. Uh, but I don't think there'll be very many surprises there. But utilities and ICT equipment, probably the two things that most teachers just simply don't want to touch if they can avoid it. They're, they're, they already are, uh, are rocketing into centralised. 
uh, approved suppliers list. This this is this is happening a fair bit, but again, going back to the Toby Young talk, I thought the approach that his school put in place was sounded very pragmatic. Uh, I suppose we have to take into account that he's a self-publicising journalist, so whether it was all 100% tribute, it's only very pragmatic that actually we do have suppliers lists, but if your spend is below a certain level, you can ignore it. If your spend's above another level, you need a bloody good argument not to use somebody on the supplier list, etc. So it'll be interesting to find out how many are doing that. And, and the conversations I've had, um, the approved suppliers list, there isn't actually a formal process particularly for getting on those. It's actually recommendations from schools, um, at, the, uh, at the group meetings, and we talk about that, and then that, that supplier goes on there because they've proved um, to existing members of the schools that actually they're someone worth dealing with. So um, I don't think at the moment there's any portal that you'll be able to go and find out who, uh, which, how to get on to a particular supplier's list. It's actually yeah. speaking to the schools that you are working with in a mat and encouraging them to get you put on to that mat. I think that um, depends as well um, if the MAT is sizable enough and has invested around the procurement specialists within the board um, because I think where we found there is a, um, a director of procurement with, with high level of procurement skills they've decided to do assessments um, yeah. and select who are the preferred suppliers whereas where that skill and that talent is not in yeah. the, the, the board they've gone more down that kind of traditional yeah. so it's just whether or not there's going to be more of that investment in yeah. I mean, get, going back to, to this that, that's why we are researching these key contacts and identifying whether they're from business or education for, for that exact reason because you're absolutely right if they've got a professional buyer that's going to change the culture of that mat and that's data that will be presenting into it's this. Interesting as well, because where, where, there, where we've seen that procurement investment, they're still not, from an educational resources point of view, they're not really wanting to touch the curriculum materials, because yeah. that really only can be achieved at classroom level, yeah. with the teacher knowing the children within that class. But something like your, your, your stable consumable type stuff, like pencils, paper, the rest of it, photocopy paper. Now, that's where they believe they can, might be able to add some kind of saving benefit overall with it. That's so down. they're almost splitting that type of resource aspect into two as well. One, one CEO specifically said toilet rolls to me. Yeah. <laughs> they focusing on toilet rolls. Yeah. Yeah. This is from school business managers predominantly, this, this, this slide. So this is the appetite for centralisation. Again, it's not particularly surprising other than, and it is early days, I was quite surprised that there was more appetite than, has, than had been fulfilled, if that makes sense so far. But bearing in mind, this data is from people that have not had that resource centralised yet. There'll be a lot more around this data as we, as we progress. So that's a quick update on where we are. Plenty more to come, and it's, it's, it's going at a pace. And, and I assume you'd all like to be kept up to date in real time, rather than just sort of wait to the end. So, so, so that, that, that will happen. I have to say, uh, echoing your point earlier on as well, the, uh, this data is going to change. Absolutely. But it's going to be critical to businesses understanding how they change their focus as well. So, absolutely relevant. We're, we're going to have to carry this on in, uh, without any doubt at all. The included awarding organisation in the assessment category? Or... Uh, yes, I think we did. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, we did. We can send you a copy of the survey. We put lots of examples because we, we were worried that people reading wouldn't necessarily know what that meant. Dave wanted to use the word apparatus, I explained to Dave that no one's used that for years. But, uh. And here you've presented it, consolidating primary and secondary. Yes, we'll be able to split all of that out, yeah. I've got some spreadsheets on here which I can show you in a moment. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So we've carried out some analysis of freely available data. Just to give you a sense of the size of the marketplace, this is the primary sector, and we're looking at income that goes into the schools how much of it is going into schools that are in mats or not in mats. So this, this sort of salmon colour are schools that are not part of a mat or are a single academy mat. So in the primary sector, 87% of the, of the money in the primary sector is not even yet being touched by any of, any of the changes that we've spoken about. So you've got there something approaching 4% of the primary income is being managed by mats that are, have got more than 11 pupils. So that, that's the primary uh, sector. The secondary sector looks quite different. So this is the secondary sector. So you're down to about 36% of the income being managed outside of mats. The monster mats um, have got this group here, which is 
probably approaching, what have we got there, about 14% is looked after by what you might call the monster mat. We've got similar data which you will eventually get on disposable income where we've taken out the obvious fixed costs and it looks a little bit different but not, not, not hugely different. So in chatting to everybody and we've just put together two or three strategies which we think you might want to think about. I'm sure everybody in this room has probably thought about them already. So probably think about whether or not how embedded they are in, in your business. So if you've got sales teams, probably, as I touched on at the beginning, think about is everything that we've just discussed, is it worth doing this session, for example, with your sales team, just committing an hour to give them their history of mats and academies so they feel slightly more comfortable around the project, etc. The first one is obvious. So know who you're talking to. So if you're on the phone to a school or you're visiting a school or you're marketing to a school, just be absolutely aware of who you're talking to. So are you talking to a school that's in a large mat? Or are you talking to a school that's in a small mat? Or are you talking to a school that's in a mat and failing, etc.? And, and understanding where that school sits is probably really, really important, particularly if you're doing face-to-face -face selling. If you're putting someone in a car to go and visit somebody, they really should know this stuff before they, before they get there. And that's relatively straightforward to do. The other one I think that a lot of people might not necessarily instantly realise is to understand how influential the school that you're talking to is. Because without a shadow of doubt, this is common sense, but it's common sense that's been borne out by the research. The more influential a school is within its mat, the more control it will have over suppliers' lists and centralised products. There's, no, there's absolutely no doubts about that. It, it is common sense, but it's been borne out as well by the research. So if you are the best school at science in your mat, you can guarantee that your head of science is talking to other science teachers in there. So it, it's absolutely essential to understand, I think, who those people are. Now, it might be that you give them better customer service. It might be that you apply more money in terms of trying to recruit those schools. It might be that if you're thinking, do we visit, don't we visit, you do visit those. Look at your existing customers. It'd be well worth looking at your existing customer base and thinking, okay, how many of my existing customer base are the best in their mat? How many of them are the, are the worst in their mat? And that might alter your, your strategy in terms of retention. Does that seem to... Now, that, that's probably slightly more, well, considerably more complicated, actually, to, to, to put in place than, than just knowing who you're talking to. But I think it could certainly pay dividends, particularly you know, if, if you're selling digital online subscription products into a school and you happen to have a good user who's the best in that academy, in that mat, you really should be talking at mat level. Now, we did a campaign um, for a few people recently and it was so old school, um, uh, I, was, I was shot. It was, it was probably 12 months ago. We work for a company that's got five or six completely separate, it was an American company actually, who've got five or six uh, completely separate uh, specialist companies in the UK. We analysed their data and we found each mat where that group had at least two scores purchasing from somebody. We then did a mail merge letter, an old fashioned mail merge letter to the CEO to basically say, we currently already provide this to that school, this to that school in your mat. Could we come and see you? to talk about how we could provide bulk discounts. First, first letter that went out, they got a contract. So it, that sort of old fashioned approach, I think is worth, worth looking at because I suspect most of us are probably looking more at digital and dynamic activity that happens in our sleep when we've got all these clever machines doing all this for us, but actually some really simple one-to-one -one approaches like that, mining your data, understanding where you've got relationships and networking those in traditional ways, I think can pay dividends and it certainly did in that instance. So, so that's, that's certainly worth, worth knowing. So the next one, this really is about managing sales people I think that are going out there and that's just having a really clear sales process and communicating that sales process because Obviously, it can be daunting going into a school, but if people actually are very clearly trained to know what sales process to take. So understanding fairly early on whether that's an influencer or a decision maker, because we found this happening an awful lot. Uh, I don't know how many people have um, identified this on their website, but a lot of the people that we're building websites for are finding a lot of people 
having abandoned baskets. And it's not necessarily that they're abandoned baskets. It's because people are getting to a point, screenshotting the basket and then sending it to the school business manager uh, and then having that, that debate with the school business manager about whether to buy it. So one of the things that's clearly happened over the last probably five to ten years, but I think it's going to get even stronger, is you need to get the person you're talking to and train them to be your internal salesperson on your behalf. So if you've got a head of science or a head of maths that wants to buy your product, you've got to, as quickly as you can, teach them to be your salesperson. So the way to do that is to give them some case studies, to give them some white papers, just to prove the efficacy of your product so that they want to go to the school business manager and actually say, hey, look, this is why I want to buy from these people. And I think that that responsibility probably is something that you might want to stress to, to salespeople that the, the, we, we, the, the old sort of, yeah, it will come, you know, we'll, we'll put that through, don't worry, we'll send you the PO, etc. We're probably way beyond that world now because a lot of the people that you're speaking to may have one or two levels to get through before they get there. So, so that, that, that's just sort of making sure that sales process is really, really clear um, uh, and helping people do that. Some good things to think about with Matt's. Martin, you mentioned about professional buyers. I don't know if you'd agree with this, but sometimes if, if you can get to speak to a professional buyer, it can be a much more fulfilling experience, seems to be the, the feedback that we've got. Uh, it might be a bit scary to try to track them down in the first place, but they will generally, if their experience, be, be into win-win. They'll, they'll, they'll have better attitude towards making sure that you're paid on time, etc., etc., etc. So I think we shouldn't necessarily be, be scared of, of that at all. We just need to embrace that the, the, these are professional buyers and, and recognise the benefits that, that, that they can bring. Buying power. This again is something that you can decide to be scared of or decide to, to embrace. So AET, £250 million, they have clearly stated they expect to have savings of £10 million per year that they have guaranteed to invest back into frontline education. <coughs> and frontline education should be benefiting people in this room. Better buying power should mean surpluses and it should mean that that money comes back to where we want it to be. School improvement and school to school support is a massive, massive part of this and that's good news for us because going back to the slide here, school to school support is, is fantastic news for us if we're already in that mat because we now know that if we've done a good job and we can give people the right tools, they will go on and sell for us to other schools within the mat. Embracing that could, could be really, really good. And one thing that I'm particularly uh, uh, light was, and I know this doesn't affect anybody here, I don't think, is that a lot of the um, mats are setting up their own teacher training programs. So there is a talent pipeline issue in the UK uh, for teachers, we all know that. There's a number of reasons that these skits and pipelines are starting, and it seems to be a lot to do with uh, finance, that if you've just walked away with a £30,000 debt uh, from university, you're unlikely to want to get another £9,000 training to be a teacher at, at, at another university. So the skits and the programmes that the academies are setting up are allowing teachers to go in, a bit like the Teach First process, but a bit more elongated, <laughs> where there'll be uh, a, a teaching assistant, high-level teaching assistant, for maybe 12 months. But during that 12 months, they're not only paid, but they're also trained by that, that school as well. One of the consequences is that they're, they're two-year programmes, but it's two years of being paid to train rather than one year of, of, of creating debt. Now, if schools paying 15 to 20,000 pound fees to recruit a head of science or, or a head of maths, if, if these mats are doing a good job of talent pipeline acquisition, that money will start to stay within, within the system. So, so there are some exciting things that they're doing. Um, and it will, well be, it will certainly be worth being aware, I think, of those teachers that are going through that program. Because one of the elements of that program is you have to do your training in two schools. So you'll do your training in, 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 in the school for the first year, you then have to finish it in another school. So that's a, again a fantastic networking opportunity. So for your sales teams to, to identify those, those types of people. So there's some of the good things, but I thought we should probably finish on something that will keep us awake at night. <laughs> Mats are gonna have huge surpluses, and one of the risks I think that we've all got is they might actually start to create their own content and their own products because they'll have the cash to do it. You're already starting to see that in a, in a number of them. So the George Abbott skit, for example, is, is being sold to other teaching schools in the country. So that, that is potentially a risk to people in this room. However, they don't have that specialism at the moment to do that. So partnering with those people uh, to do those types of things could be a big opportunity. Um, but I think it's inevitable that some of these, with the surpluses they've got, will think about investing that money to create their own 
resources and, and, and content uh, to then go out and sell to the, to the wider market. So, so if you do want to stay, if you, want, if you want a good night's sleep, then you know, let's finish there. If you want to be a bit worried, then let's finish there. Well, thank you so much for coming all the way down. Really, uh, I really appreciate it. And as I say, we see this as the start of the conversation. So uh, please, please keep in touch. And thank you. Cheers.